no one would have believed that in the last years of the 19th century, human affairs were being scrutinized from the timeless worlds of space. Few men even considered the possibility of life on other planets. Yet, across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this world with envious eyes, and slowly but surely they drew their plans in crayon. Scanning for audio. Welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast, this time talking about the Martian invasion of Earth from Big Finish. Yes, we know the original novel as War of the Worlds, and that's fine. As you could clearly hear from the introduction, I am a tiny bit of a fan. Now, here's a confession. Something that I actually talk about in the book Geek Myths. Oh, quick question. Is anyone out there a literary agent? You might be, you might not be, you probably aren't. But if you are, and you're interested in representing me, drop me an email, please. Look, that's beside the point. What I need to talk about is the Martian invasion of Earth. H.G. Wells' last great adaptation by Big Finish. We've had The Invisible Man. We've had The First Men in the Moon. We've had The Island of Dr. Moreau. All gloriously brilliant. The almost impossible to adapt shape of things to come. Again, utterly superb. But it's... War of the Worlds, that is, his ultimately crowning achievement in the world of science fiction. Because not only do we get a blow-by-blow account of the landing, the invasion, the bridgehead, the building, the, the actual subjugation of the human race, but we also get an actual, proper ending to the story. This is fabulous storytelling. Now, there are tales of H.G. Wells going on a cycle holiday across the south of England and every time he stayed at a bed and breakfast that he didn't quite enjoy the landlady or landlord were particularly snippy with him well he wreaked his revenge in War of the Worlds like a massive game of well Warhammer or a war game just sweeping huge bits of the countryside asunder. Now here we have perhaps the most faithful adaptation because like me you are probably first aware of War of the Worlds via a different source. You've all covered the exciting world of first exposure preference, where the first version of the story that you hear, read or see or experience, yes, the medium is the message, well, that that gets to be the version that's built into your heart, nailed to the wall, shall we say. And for a lot of people of my generation, the first version of War of the Worlds they come across wasn't the George Powell version, although that does have some fantastic moments. No, it's Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds, and that is the reason. There is an audio version of War of the Worlds that tours and has albums and has singles, and that is part of British culture through and through. That is the version of War of the Worlds that we used to, but it's a musical. Yes, you can go to Sheffield Arena and see the giant silver war machines crawl over the audience and everyone oohs and ahs and and goes, Oh, that's not David Essex, it's him off Neighbours, but isn't he awfully good? Yeah, that's the kind of thing we're doing. But for a certain age, the double album LP or even the curiously extra tracked CD, well, that was for us. Now, as I said in Geek Myths, there's this chapter all about War of the Worlds. Bear with me, this is important. And in it, because I won't bother reading it all to you now, I tell of how, as a child, I thought... Now don't laugh. Please, don't laugh. I was very young. I thought there was, indeed, a version... Oh, I'll come out and say it. I thought we'd actually been invaded by Martians. You see, I had War of the Worlds on a tape. Not a CD, a cassette. A C90. Now, some of you who also had it on a C90 are a little bit ahead of me because it didn't quite all fit. We'd been to Wall's End Public Library, had our 
needle on our record player examined on a very close-up screen, I believe. I was always told this, that they always examined your needle. And then we'd spent our, I believe it was 50 pence, bringing the album home, and then we put it onto tape. And then I would listen to it over and over again. I think my dad sorted this out in order to stop me listening to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy over and over again, quite as much as I did. So, this musical adaptation of to what I was informed in my head was a true event because, and I've thought about this, Oh What a Lovely War had just been on TV and my brain, my small child's brain, went, right, historical events in the past get turned into musicals. See? So, on a trip to London, I was asked what I wanted to see. And I said, can we go to a museum? And my parents looked at me like, we've got all these sites to see, but yeah, you want to see a museum. Which one? I want to see the Martian war machines. Because I knew they'd landed on Horsell Common. I knew that they would all be gathered in one place, probably in the Victorian Albert Museum. It was at this point, in the streets of London, where my dad was shocked to discover a 99 Cornet would cost 99 pence. And apparently that was why they were called 99. All of these memories of our trip to London as a very small child are flooding back that I was informed none of it was real. None of it was true. It was just an album that I listened to on tape. But of course it was in my head. I would sing Forever Autumn. I'd be able to quote huge sections. I would often go, oh, I've got a plan. And in my head I would hear do 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 do. Then later on, the George Powell version was introduced to me, possibly at six o'clock on BBC Two. And the story eked its way inside. And then, of course, there was the novel that I read while I was working in Dylan's The Bookstore in Newcastle. And that was when I discovered the true and marvellous world of Wells. And that is what we have here from Big Finish. We've got your standard Martian invasion story. But all of the little fiddly bits, the moral ambiguity, the dilemmas... The desperate clamber for survival. The fact that the Martians only truly land in this story in the south of England, not around the world. In order to take out, well, the world's greatest empire at the time. It makes complete sense that they would do that. Yes, I know in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Volume 2, it's all dealt with remarkably elegantly. But here we've got something absolutely magical. A brilliant adaptation. Beat for beat, perfect. And, for my money, better than the Jeff Wayne one. The sound design here has a noise that is used to represent the Martian heat ray. And it's even better than someone going, Ooh la. And that's a feat in itself. So yes, witness the Martians land. Witness someone saying that the chances of anything coming from Mars are a million to one. And then just let it wash over you. Because it's as bleak as an episode of Survivors. It's very Victorian. And the scene in the airship, well, that'll stick with you much longer than you thought. And will the Martians return? Well, that would be telling. And with that, I'll play you the trailer and let you decide for yourself in the future. But as far as I'm concerned, this is the one we were waiting for. And it just didn't disappoint. Which was the thing I was most worried about. Perhaps all of these HG Wells will be made available at some point in a box set or even in a sale. But either way, I don't care. This is magical. It took me right back. And as far as I'm concerned, it's simply perfect. Be seeing you. This is the testimony of a survivor. (laughs) My dear Herbert, the chances against anything manlike on Mars are a million to one. Damn it! (laughs) (laughs) I I really don't know why you persist with that thing. A writer needs exercise. Good God! The signals of Woking Railway Station. Indeed. (laughs) There's nothing fanciful or fantastical about those. I find them entirely safe and tranquil. Which is exactly how life should be. Hello! Hello in there, I say! Do you hear me? Take me to this thing. On Horsell Common? 
But we heard nothing. Do you, do you honestly think this could possibly be true? We're hearing a lot of renewed movement inside the cylinder. Two thousand and eighteen brings with it three brilliant conventions, all held at the Derby Quad. ShadowCon two, the UFO convention, will be on June the thirtieth, two thousand and eighteen. Hooverville, the best little Doctor Who convention in the world, is on Saturday the first of September, while Big Finish Day is on the third of November, two thousand and eighteen. All tickets are available from the Derby Quad website. That was the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast, available on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter, RSS, Vimeo, and across the internet. Doctor Who and its associated properties are all copyright and trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Why not become a supporter by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog? Contact the show on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. 